Well, good evening, my friends. Welcome to another exciting virtual event with Pretty Gritty Tours and the City of Tacoma's Historic Preservation Office. And this is, of course, for those of you who have been coming along on our journey, the finale of Tacoma Noir, a four-part murder mystery series historically based on the City of Tacoma in which you've had the opportunity to find out who the killer is. For those of you who are here tonight, Thank you so much for joining me on a Sunday evening, Memorial Day weekend. And this is the end, the end of not only this, but of Historic Preservation Month. It has been an incredible journey to go through all of, well, I mean, it's a national event, but to see everything that Tacoma has prepared and put together has been amazing and absolutely astounding. And to be a part of that, whew, what a dream. Tonight, not only are you going to find out who the killer is definitively, but also, we're going to talk about how we got here, what was going on in Tacoma in the 1920s, and why our beautiful city is, arguably, I'm making this case, the birthplace of noir. The genre itself emanated from this city and an event that happened here. So, if you guys are ready, uh, because I don't want you to suffer too much longer. Let's uh, let's begin with the last few minutes of Tacoma Noir. If you haven't been following along up to this point, well, you're about to find out who did it, and then you're going to have to Quentin Tarantino the whole thing and start from the beginning. Here we go. The City of Tacoma's Historic Preservation Office, in association with Pretty Gritty Tours, presents Tacoma Noir. Larry Handelson looked up at Ray Rook. The 38 revolver still in his hand, his eyes narrowed. A half dozen officers swiveled their barrels towards the Pinkerton. What the hell is this, Rook? Here's your man, Charles. Ray, what are you doing? Pinkerton agent Larry Handelson. Here's the man you want. He murdered Sam Glenn. Like hell he did. Start talking, Ray. Took me a minute to figure it out. Vincent here was pulling the strings on Joseph Walter, getting him to take the blackmail photos of people in town to lean on him. He had everyone in his pocket, just like the priest. When the action got too tense for the priest, he came to me, hoping I would go after Joseph as the killer and he would be rid of his blackmailer. Except Vincent tailed him and saw what was going on. That night in the bathhouse, Vincent here killed the priest. He must have promised Joseph a lot of money because he had him hook, line, and sinker. Joseph tried to apply the pressure on Sam Glenn, too, get him to change the direction of the steam tunnels to go underneath the safe in the new Washington building. Wait, the safe? The safe was the play all along. They knew they couldn't tunnel underneath it without running into the water table and run the risk of drowning in a grave they dug themselves. They needed Sam to provide a city-authorized route under the safe. From there, Joseph would be their Peterman and blow a hole in the bottom, the same way he learned from Ray Gamble. I wouldn't be surprised if the string of safe robberies in the area have some connection to him as well. He had the liquid nitrogen, the explosives, and the knowledge. What he didn't have was a way to move that tunnel. Joseph and Vincent needed Sam alive. Once I knew that, I knew they didn't kill him. 
Besides, Vincent here was in the cooler the night of the murder. As were you, Steele. Is that true? It is. I was pressing this scumbag for information the night of the murder. We didn't get anything, though. And you and your team cut him loose in the morning. Larry didn't know that, though. And he had already made plans to go kill Vincent, didn't you? Larry Hendelson hadn't let go of his revolver. The air in the room was so tense you could have played it like a string instrument. I found his stakeout spot across the street. Shredded blue bore tobacco all over the corner. Also, only a pro tears up his cigarettes after, to avoid detection. Ironically, that's the first thing that tipped me off. When Sam Glenn showed up at the job site in the middle of the night, you plugged him, thinking he was Vincent. You didn't know he was in an interrogation room that night. When you found out what you did, you dragged the body up the tower and threw him over, hoping he would land in the pit and look like a suicide. That's when your button came off. Ray Rook produced the worn brass button from his pocket. Bad luck that it fell into Sam's pocket on the way down. Alan, former military man, would never let his uniform look that shabby. Only a beat-down union breaker out of Montana would still have the old worn brass from Tiffany & Co. This is garbage. Why would you believe this broken-down old gumshoe? You're gonna shut up for a minute. Right. What was Sam even doing down there that night anyhow? I think you'll find your answers right there. Without taking his eyes off Larry, he nodded his head towards Mitzi. The money was just too good, wasn't it, Dull? Mitzi slowly sat up in the chair. The look of fear she let drop from her face like a cheap mask. Ray, baby, what are you saying? Joseph here may have worked for Vincent, but he was in your palm. You were the one who suggested that he blackmail Sam. Maybe get him alone in the dressing room with you and he could snap some shots once you had him pinned. That's why he still smelled of your perfume, doll. That man must have been made of some solid stuff, though, to have turned you down. I don't know that I could have done it. Is it illegal to try and have a good time with a guy? Dollface, come on! You ain't gonna sell me down the river, are you? Baby, we had a good thing! An officer cuffed Joseph across the back of his head to shut him up. Problem was, Sam Glenn may have been the last honest man in Tacoma. He wouldn't have any of it. No one could have predicted he'd still be faithful to his wife, especially with her cheating on him. Sally Glenn looked up like she was trying to melt into the shadows. Wide-eyed, she looked at the group. I imagine the Sandberg outfit approached Sam first. When he turned him down, Sally tried to convince him that he should do it, because the money would be good. When he refused, she found a new way in. Sally thought she could get Doyle Farrington, the architect, to move the tunnel, if she was in his bed. Of course, he could only do so much. He drafted the plans, but only Sam had the authorization to make them a reality. You'll find everything you need in the documents there, Charles. Plus, if I'm not mistaken, Oscar Richter probably has the ballistics for you, confirming that the 38 slug found inside Sam Glenn was fired from Larry Hendelson's revolver. Ray motioned to Betty. She handed the chief detective the package she had collected from the post box where Ray had stashed it the first day. Why, though? The money, Charles. The Sandberg outfit was willing to pay any one of them to get access into the largest and most secure safe in Tacoma. Only problem was, Sam Glenn wouldn't do it. It's just bad luck that Larry here mistook him for a crook and took him off the board. Larry Handelson made the slightest motion to raise his revolver when Charles Burns' large revolver leapt from his holster with startling speed and came <coughs> crashing down on the Pinkerton's face. He collapsed as the chief detective let the revolver maul its target. Get him out of here! And her and him! Charles pointed at Mitzi and Joseph. Please, I'm not a bad girl. I'm just in a bad way. You can tell your sad stories to a judge. Jesus, we don't have enough handcuffs for this city. What about this one, Ray? Charles pointed to Sally Glenn, who had retreated against the wall, her dark eyes defiant and wild. It's not a crime to be a terrible wife and a faithless person. She tried to use us all, but she never had the conviction to get her hands dirty. She just pulled the strings of those caught in her web. Didn't even have the decency to be honest with me at the end. I guess you're free to go, miss. 
As the officers bundled up the occupants of the room and shuffled them off to the police station, Alan Steele came forward. Thank you, Rook. I'm embarrassed that we didn't catch this sooner and deal with it in-house. If it turns out that this is true, then you have helped preserve the reputation of the Pinkerton Agency by getting this guy before he could do more damage. If you need anything, you ask me. They shook hands. As everyone cleared out, Ray was left alone with Sally Glenn. She purred ever so slightly as she moved in close to him. Leaning in, she pressed her face against his chest. Oh, Mr. Rook, I was so frightened. You were so clever. You figured it out and you saved me. Ray Rook took out a cigarette and lit it, letting the shadows get pushed back from his face, though they never left his eyes. Get out of here, doll. Everyone ends up in lockdown tonight. Only difference is, you've made your own prison. Sally Glenn opened her mouth to speak, then pulled away from Ray Rook, letting her fingers linger on his chest for a moment. Then she slipped out the door. She left the same way she came into this life, silent and full of fury, like a velvet sledgehammer. The scent of her lingered as Ray took another drag of his cigarette. Chief Detective Charles Byrne came and stood next to Ray Rook. Hey, cheer up, Ray. At least you're not in prison tonight. Ray Rook took another drag of his cigarette. Exhaling the smoke, he pushed away the scent of Sally Glenn. All of us are serving time, Charles. Some of us are still just walking around while we do it. Ray Rook tipped his hat to the chief detective and went back out into the city to find a drink. Oh, man. So now you know. There it is. Uh, I stressed a lot about this entire production for a long time, uh, trying to make sure that everything that was needed was presented throughout. And hopefully, getting through all that evidence was something that everybody did uh, and came to the right conclusion. And I admit, everyone was suspicious. Everyone was a bad person, but there was only one person who could have done it at the end of it there. And a couple people figured that out. So congratulations to our winners tonight, uh, Astrid Starcher and Michelle DeBell for figuring out correctly that Larry Hendelson, Pinkerton agent, or Pinkerton operative really, was the guy behind the whole murder. Uh, please send me your contact info later and we will be providing you with a free copy of The Maltese Falcon, the definitive noir novel based right here in Tacoma. So, oh man, this is so great. I, watching everybody's answers come through has been the absolute best part of this whole experience for me. Because like I said, uh, everyone had some very, very serious concerns, you'd be probably not surprised to find out that of the very, very large number of answers that we've had come in over the course of this whole thing, the overwhelming majority thought it was Sally Glenn. Uh, and if, if you go back through, at least to my knowledge, there's no real evidence to point towards her other than her just being sort of a scumbag, a nasty scumbag. So, and a uh, brief shout out to all of the fantastic voice actors that volunteered their time for this, turning it from what was going to be like a good project into a truly phenomenal one. I can't thank you all enough. In particular, you, Mr. Nick Temple, uh, our very own Larry Hendelson here, who went through this whole thing not knowing that he was the murderer. None of the voice actors knew until the very end who did it. So, whew. and yeah, she was so sketchy. She was 100% sketchy. But tonight, I want you guys to join me on a brief journey because uh, the way that we got here is something that has been kicking around in my head for a while now, where Tacoma in the 1920s was a wild town full of crime and darkness and terror, and it inspired, in more ways than one, this noir genre. And so when the city of Tacoma approached me and they're like, hey, here's what we're doing. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the perfect venue 
to jump on this. And so I really would like to also acknowledge the incredible work done by Mr. Sean Alexander, who came up with all of the art uh, that you guys have got to enjoy here. He took those historic landmarks, folded them into these very noir posters, and we got to go through all that. And if you haven't seen him or done them yet, he also did the sort of Where's Waldo themed ones that are also based on those same historic buildings and track the story of Ray Rook as he's going through Tacoma. Uh, this is also a very exciting part for me at this point because I can now take this all down out of my office and I don't have to look like a psychopath who's been planning a murder for months now. But I also just want you to know, <laughs> I, I tried to have every piece of the timeline and all the evidence and everyone all figured out going into this. And I hope, I really hope that that came through. But noir, the genre, comes from Tacoma. And I wanted that story to come through in, in the Ray Rook story as well. And so for us to get to that point, we need to go back a little ways to this guy right here, Sam Dashiell Hammett, the author of The Maltese Falcon, who wrote a tremendous body of work and is, I'm pretty confident, the undisputed father of noir. Like there were detective novels before Sam, but there were none that were noir. And when he wrote The Maltese Falcon, he based it on his time here in Tacoma. So let's uh, let's go through. Sam started his career as a Pinkerton operative. He was working for the Pinkerton Detective Agency in the 1920s. And then when he was 26 years old, he just started hacking up blood while he was out breaking up unions in Montana. And after coughing up enough blood, they're like, you got to go get checked out. And so they ship him off to Tacoma's Cushman Hospital where he ends up spending uh, a few months here in Tacoma recovering. And during that time period, the Pinkerton agency let him go. And they're like, you're done. We don't have any use for a guy with tuberculosis. A few things that were notable happened to him at that point. First, he met a nurse at the Cushman Hospital that would later become his wife when they moved down to San Francisco together. And a, a particular event that everything we've talked about was based on happened here in Tacoma, where in December of uh, like 1924, I think 1924, 1925, there was a man named Sam Hamlet, which was very similar to Sam Hammett. Uh, and Sam Hamlet was a father of six. He was a carpenter and his teenage daughter, like tween daughter was gonna have a birthday party at their house and invite all her friends. And he's like, Ugh, I don't wanna be around for this. So he's like, I'm gonna go down to my two adult sons newsstand, buy a newspaper, maybe get a, maybe get a coffee or something and hang out with them. And his wife was like, absolutely not, Sam. Uh, Tacoma is a terrible crime infested town. Don't go out in the middle of the night. And he's like, don't worry, I'm gonna be fine. So he goes down to downtown Tacoma his sons aren't at the newsstand. And so he's like, not sure what to do. Decides that he's just gonna walk the streets for a little while. And he starts to panic. Thinking back to what his wife said about it being a dangerous town, he decides to just hook back and head straight home. At the same time, uh, just down the street from him, a brand new beat cop to the city of Tacoma uh, by the name of Kraft, Officer Kraft, just gets a phone call on the police box that there is a criminal out in the area who just committed a robbery wearing a long black coat and hat and that they should be on the lookout for this guy. And he sees someone in a long black coat and hat walking down the street and orders him to stop. And the guy that he orders to stop is Sam Hamlet. Sam panics thinking that he's about to get robbed. So he just starts running down the street as fast as he can. And Officer Kraft fires a warning shot into the air. Uh, at this point, we have to assume that Sam was in a complete panic because he starts running even faster. And so Officer Kraft fires a warning shot, this time into the ground. And out of nowhere, it ricochets off the granite curb and then comes up and kills Sam Hamlet. 
uh, he bleeds out in the street and then it's front page news. And Dashiell Hammett, Sam Dashiell Hammett, has this whole existential crisis because as he's reading the newspaper the next morning on December 15th, he thinks he sees his name in the paper because it says Sam Hamlet. And he gets obsessed with this, this accidental manslaughter. Uh, Officer Kraft ends up disappearing. Uh, there are no records of him. He just vanishes into the history ether. And Hamlet goes on to be this tragic figure publicized again and again in the city of Tacoma. And why this is important is because it ends up being one of the most important features, arguably, in the Maltese Falcon. So if you're familiar with the Maltese Falcon, not the Humphrey Bogart feature-length film, but the actual story, the novel of it, there's this point in the middle of the novel where the detective, Sam Spade, has the femme fatale in his room, and he just starts talking to her about this story. And he tells her when he was working as a detective in Tacoma, that this event happened and it changed his life forever. This is where it gets juicy, my friends. Uh, a local artist here in Tacoma, um, I don't know if I have his picture right now. I'll see if I can find it for you guys. But a local artist here in Tacoma did a, a graphic, uh, like a graphic novel style comic strip of, it's called the Flitcraft Parable, which shows up in the middle of the Maltese Falcon. And I can bring that up for you guys here really quick. But right, non sequitur, completely detached to anything. Sam Spade, the detective in the Maltese Falcon is like, yeah, working in Tacoma. Uh, I, I ran down this case one time where a distraught wife comes in and tells me that she's, she's looking for her husband. So I pull a few leads, I do some detective work and I end up tracking him down in Spokane where I used to be a detective. And there at the Davenport Hotel in downtown Spokane, he finds this guy and he's like, what the hell's the deal? And the guy that he finds is like, you know what? Uh, I don't feel bad at all. I left my family in the middle of the night and it was no big deal for me. And so Sam Spade presses him a little more and is like, you're going to have to tell me what's going on. And he's like, you know what? I would like to tell you my story for the first time ever because I've never told it to anyone, which if we're drawing some parallels right now, for this young Pinkerton operative here in Tacoma to have been deeply affected by something and then have some literature mirror in life right now. I think you're all with me. Here we go. So he says that when he was in Spokane, that he was walking down the street next to this unfinished skyscraper looming across the Tacoma skyline when an I-beam falls 11 stories down and crushes the sidewalk right in front of him. And a piece of the sidewalk ricochets up and chips off, cuts his cheek, and he gets shaken to his core, where he's like, oh my gosh, I could have been killed, and I'm not a bad guy. I've never done anything wrong, but that's maybe just how life works. Good people die for no reason, and bad people get away because there is no justice. So he just disappears. He immediately leaves Tacoma, goes, travels the world everywhere, uh, having new experiences, just living his best life until things get boring. And then he moves to Spokane, he gets married, and he starts a whole new family. Uh, when he finishes his story, Sam Spade, the detective, is like, what the heck is this about? Uh, this makes no sense because this guy ends up going back to exactly what he had the first time. Like his new wife reminded him exactly of the old wife. He starts a whole new family doing the exact same thing, just in a different spot. And then this is the key point. At the end, when he's talking to our femme fatale, he's like, and that's the beauty of it. He adjusted himself to beams falling and then no more of them fell. And he adjusted himself to them not falling. And then they just go right back into the novel, like nothing happened. And there is so much speculation that this is what happened to Sam Dashiell Hammett, that he was a Pinkerton operative, just living his normal life. He gets tuberculosis. He ends up going to Tacoma where they let him go. He has no options, no prospects, nothing going on in his life. And so he starts writing crime novels, essentially. 
and he becomes super, super rich and famous for it. He gets married and he starts a whole new life, but some part of him was always attached to the old life. The fact that the story literally takes place in Tacoma and that that's no stretch of the imagination to believe that it focuses on the Washington building, which was the most prominent story in Tacoma because it was this abandoned skyscraper. They had this whole building that was gonna come up and change the whole city. And when the bank president, Oli Larson, ends up getting convicted of scammery and scumbaggery, the building just gets left there unoccupied. And at one point an I-beam did fall off of it. The fact that it's called the Flitcraft Parable and that it was Officer Craft who ends up accidentally killing this just guy on the street with a ricochet bullet is a major pivot point for a lot of people in Tacoma, but very specifically uh, Sam, Sam Dashiell Hammett, who launches this whole noir genre. And now what's really extraordinary about all of this is that these places, these landmarks have been preserved. They've been saved from destruction. And so now when you're going through the pages of the Maltese Falcon or through the history books of the 1920s of crime-soaked Tacoma, you can still walk downtown and the Washington building is right there. The corner where the I-beam fell and changed someone's life forever is still there. The Whiskey Row, you know, this is a shot from the 1920s, uh, 1925 Pacific Avenue, where the whole Ray Rook saga takes place right there. And you can still see all these buildings in particular with their original facades. Now that you know the answer to everything, I encourage you guys to go back through, I'll share the link here in a little bit. The Tacoma Building Index is on uh, the Tacoma Public Library digital archive. And I also tried to make sure that you could have solved this just by going through all of that with some quick Google searches, uh, because everything from the brass buttons on the Pinkerton coat to the dates where things were happening, I really struggled to make sure matched up with everything that you could do some historic research on. I may have gone way, way overboard on this project, but I've become obsessed with it. It's the like noir Tacoma story, whew, whew, it really, it got me in my feels. So here's what's even more interesting for me is that when I was looking at everything here, I was doing some more research on Dashiell Hammett and like what his life was like as a Pinkerton and what a shady dude. Uh, the first page Google resort, <laughs> resort, First page Google results always talk about what a phenomenal novelist Dashiell Hammett is and how he changed uh, the murder mystery fiction forever by creating this whole new genre that people hadn't encountered before. And he has a massive body of work to back that first page Google result up. Like if you look at the major novels that he's done, you can see him everywhere. You can recognize the names, see him in cinema. If you go through his um, bibliography, there are so many short stories, novels, collections. The Sam Spade saga is several novels deep. Uh, and there's like a shrine to this guy. Uh, this is the apartment building that he was living in in San Francisco as he was writing all of these crime novels. And that's where it started to change. So I was looking more into his life after Tacoma and a lot of the people that knew him were like, oh, for sure, he is a phenomenal writer. One quote that I thought was really powerful in particular uh, from a, a novelist that worked with him was that he said, quote, Hammett gave murder back to the kind of people that commit it for reasons, not just to provide a corpse and with that, with the means at hand, not with hand wrought dueling pistols uh, and tropical fish, he's said to have lacked heart that the story he thought most of himself, the glass key, is the record of a man's devotion to a friend. He was spare, frugal, hard boiled, but he did over and over again what only the best writers can ever do all at once. He wrote scenes that seemed to have never been written before. Uh, and that's what I love about 
Hammett's writing and about his story is that he put human back into these novels, that he took murder away from just being something that just happened uh, and tried to apply reasons to it, which I think is brutally ironic considering that the event that pushed him into no longer being a Pinkerton, but becoming a writer and then gave him his first most powerful novel was a death that happened for no reason at all. It was just an accident. Uh, and that people that should have been brought to justice weren't, and that people that should have carried on living happy lives died for no reason. And that, boom, is noir in a nutshell. Now, doing some more research on Dashiell, things got even seedier, because um, he had a reputation for being a pathological liar, for being incredibly violent with women, uh, including his new wife, and for being a charlatan across the board. And when you look at the actual record of Dashiell Hammett as his time as a Pinkerton operative, uh, there's almost nothing. Uh, in the stories that he would tell over and over again, he had a, a wound on his head, like a scar. And he used to claim that it had resulted from having been struck in the head by a brick thrown by a rioting striker in Montana and that he found the guy and brought him into custody. Except there's an actual record still preserved at the Pinkerton Detective Agency, which by the way, is still a thing out in the world, um, that uh, labor activist Frank Little in Butte was the guy that actually got hit in the head. Uh, and then in 1917, Hammett claimed that he discovered the gold stolen in the Sonoma case, except a different agency altogether of private investigators found that. So he has all of these stories that he's told about himself over the years that can verifiably be attributed to other people or were completely made up across the board. So he just invented this whole persona of having been an ace investigator. Uh, the only Pinkertons that ever have on record said anything about him were guys that never worked with him. They were Pinkertons that had heard about stuff he had maybe done years after he had just become a famous novelist. And everyone was like, yeah, mm, we don't actually know anything about him. Um, the only record, and this is the most bananas thing for me ever, the only record that has uh, Hammett on there is the Pinkerton agency tasked him to follow people during his career as a Pinkerton operative. And the one case they got him one case he was assigned to was to find a missing Ferris wheel that had been stolen by a Pinkerton client. I want you all to sink in for a second with that knowledge. The only case Mr. Sam Dashiell Hammett ever solved was finding a Ferris wheel that had been stolen. Now, as you know, <clears throat> I'm not a detective, but I feel pretty confident that if a Ferris wheel went missing, I could probably find it. There is a, a quote from a private investigator who's worked from like 2000 up through 2021, who did a tremendous amount of forensic analysis on the life and times of Dashiell Hammett, who said that if you run a detective agency, you know, you send your, your least accomplished operatives to find a haystack. You send your really good operatives to find the needle in the haystack, and you send your absolute best ones to find the conspiracy that would lead someone to hide a needle in a haystack, which I think speaks volumes about the life and times of Mr. Dashiell Hammett. And once you have that perspective on, if you go back through his writing, you can really see that perhaps he wasn't a great detective at all. Even with the Maltese Falcon, which for those of you who are about to read it now, because it's such a good book, uh, I don't want to ruin it for you too much, but to say that uh, Sam Spade never, he always finds the right answer, but he never finds something that would stand up in court. There's never any evidence. There's never forensic proof. There's never anything that as an actual investigator, you would need to bring to the table. He just has good intuitions and follows his gut which uh, I think was something that applied to our own Ray Rook one here. So when writing it, I really tried to ensure 
that if you were to go through with a fine tooth comb and apparently a very fine tooth comb, you could find very deliberate things, specific time alibis, uh, guns that were used, murder weapons, bullets, scents, uh, and buttons, things that were left behind that could only be traced back to one individual. And if you laid them all on top of each other, which again, I had my murder board up on the wall for a couple months, it could only point to one direction there. The other thing I really tried to do with this whole thing is to give an accurate picture, though fictional, of life and times in the 1920s. So the Pinkertons were in Tacoma and they operated as private investigators or a lot of times as hired muscle for moneyed people. Uh, in particular, the railroad would bring in the Pinkertons to watch over safes to ensure that safety of their payrolls was being taken care of, or a lot of times to come in and break up unions. Uh, they were they were thugs that would infiltrate into union groups and then smash people up to keep them from striking. Uh, and yes, those who can't do right. And that's the thing. He's a brilliant writer. And what he really brought to the table was to bring that human element into it to provide motive and heart. And so if that's something that he accomplished of without anything else, fantastic. Mm. That was a good one. So let me give you a, a picture of Tacoma in the 1920s too and sort of connect the dots for you guys about things that were going on in Ray Rook's world that also were happening for realsies, as they say in the academic community, uh, in Tacoma in the 1920s, but also you can still see today. So this is the federal building. It is the post office on A Street. It was briefly the temporary headquarters for an FBI investigation. You can still encounter it right downtown today. Uh, this is the Hotel Winthrop, which is still right downtown in Tacoma today. Uh, the Gamble House. This is like one of my favorites because Robert Walker, who was in uh, Tacoma Noir, was a real figure who made his fortune off of stone in the Tacoma area and then had this house built for him. And then Ray Gamble, who was another real life dude who every word about him was true. He was an aspiring amateur magician who made just an insane amount of money by developing a way to stabilize dynamite using sawdust. And he was an avid collector of elephants. He had the most extensive collection of elephants on record in the world for a period there. Uh, this is Ray Gamble in the Gamble House circa 1935 with a small, mind you, small portion of his elephant collection in front of him. And he would buy elephants that were like, sickeningly enough, carved out of ivory and then set with precious gems and then uh, filigreed with gold. And then he just put them on a shelf next to like dime store elephants that he found along the way. He was a remarkably eccentric, truly remarkable man and a huge fan of Harry Houdini. And he actually hosted a party in the Gamble House where he had Harry Houdini's wid widow as the guest of honor. Uh, and in fact, the Gamble House did have secret panels that you could press open and slot machines would pop out. He did have a private stage in the basement for magic performances. And yes, if you weren't already aware, Ray Gamble, along with De Chief Detective Charles Byrne was expertly voiced by local celebrity and actor, Paul Richter. And uh, <clears throat> again, I can't stress enough, on both sides of this, how incredible and unyielding the support of the city of Tacoma's historic preservation office was and just like cutting me loose to do this project, but also all of the voice actors that came out for this rocked my world. Whew, such good stuff. Another place that you can go see today is uh, the Hotel Olympus. And the Hotel Olympus was built by beer baron Leopold Schmidt in 1909 to uh, suckle away some of the money that Tacoma was stealing from Olympia Beer and bring it back into his own pockets. And inside today, so this is the Forum 
restaurant. It still looks remarkably like this as the forum today. Uh, and then downstairs, uh, it's still there, but not nearly this elegant and beautiful is the mirror room. And the mirror room was the, the swankiest speakeasy on Whiskey Row. It was a major jazz club and restaurant throughout the years and offered a lot of entertainment, both illegal and otherwise, for the denizens of Tacoma. And directly across the street was this fantastic soda shop uh, and pinball joint that offered a lot of uh, speakeasy entertainment in the vaulted underground section of the sidewalk down there. Uh, and this was 1924. And here's something I really love about this. This is looking down the street towards the Hotel Olympus. I'm gonna blow this one up for you really quick here. Notice the center of the street subterranean restroom. This is part of a massive network of underground establishments that ran throughout the entire city of Tacoma. The steam tunnels were a very real thing. All of Tacoma's downtown core was on central steam heat for a long period of time there. Uh, but they also did have, like in episode two, underground bathhouses. And some were totally legit establishments where uh, lumberjacks or sailors of Japanese or Swedish or Norwegian descent could go uh, and get clean if they didn't own a home or something here and then ship back out to sea or the forest. Uh, but some of them were illicit dens of debauchery, whoring and drinking. And they accidentally discovered one just just on a whim underneath the old spaghetti factory. Uh, the Pacific Plaza block, when they were redoing some of the subterranean sections so that they could put new sewer and lighting in under the parking garage, they just happened to stumble across a underground bathhouse. And it's still perfectly preserved there. They use it as a water storage tank now for their rooftop garden. And Historic Tacoma's Facebook page has some really good uh, photos of that bathhouse when they went down to document it. Uh, and this is it right here, which is just absolutely astounding, isn't it? As far as characters in the Ray Rook story, I really wanted to make sure that we had touch points as well. So uh, this gentleman on the far right is Chief Detective Dick Deadeye Greenwood. He was a sharpshooter and lead detective in the city of Tacoma. This is him on the back alley of what is the old city hall building and was the police headquarters in 1924. Uh, and this is a, a lineup of officers who are getting ready for a sharpshooting competition in the regional area. And man, they, they had some crazy photos. This is old city hall again. And so that abandoned giant structure on the far corner of Pacific Avenue, which was once Whiskey Row, uh, had the police headquarters down in the basement there. And when you see that building today, it's easy to forget that even now, it still has the original jail cells down in the basement there. I also really wanted to... Uh, bring up Mitzi, because Mitzi is a character that I tried to base on someone in real life as well, uh, although a little bit farther on down the line. Some of you might be familiar with the name Faith Bacon. Faith Bacon was considered for a period of time the most beautiful woman in the world, and she was a con artist and famous stripper in the 1940s who actually did uh, the Dance of Shame. You can find it on YouTube. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, so she was my inspiration for Mitzi. And while she did not visit Tacoma and Opera Alley, there were a collection of high-end sort of like erotic acts that came through on the vaudeville circuit uh, through what is still the Pantages today. Uh, and then also the, the Grand Tacoma Theater, which unfortunately you will not see today after it burned down in an extraordinary fire during a screening of the birds, Hitchcock's The Birds, uh, that was just an empty space on the Tacoma skyline for a while, and now it's a subway. So some things change, some things stay the same. But I also really wanted to make sure that there were 
very historic elements in this whole thing that tracked what was actually going on in Tacoma at the same time. So the whole thing about safe robberies is true. Uh, this picture is from December 5th, 1924, which is uh, one of the days that the Ray Rook Noir actually happens, where there was a series of safe robberies that were going on throughout the city of Tacoma, where people were using nitroglycerin um, to try and crack safes. This is one of the few that they didn't get through. They were using a form of um, liquid nitrogen to break the locks before putting explosives on them as well. And everything about the, the Brotherhood Cooperative National Bank tracks as well, because after the scandal with the Washington building happened, the Brotherhood Cooperative National Bank building with um, Warren, one of the guys from our script here, did come in, rebuy the building, and installed a massive safe in the basement of it, as well as a printing press. Uh, some of you may be familiar that before uh, national standards of money, individual banks printed notes like this. So this is from uh, 1924. Yeah, this, this was printed December 27th, 1924. So literally just days after Ray Rook's Tacoma Noir takes place, that these bills were being printed here in Tacoma and they were legal tender throughout the United States. And there's only a few of these left, sadly, but you can find collectum items on there. You can also still find a whole collection on the Pinkerton trivia page of the ages of brass buttons that were used for Pinkerton agents. And specifically, this is how deep I went, my friends, which operatives had which buttons. So Union Breakers in Montana had these brass buttons in particular uh, that had Pinkerton Railroad Detective on there and then Tiffany & Co. on the back. So the next time, if for whatever reason I get talked into another one of these, that there is a Ray Rook mystery, just know I go real deep, my friends. All your clues will be there, I promise. Uh, the Grand Tacoma Hotel as well, which was right on the waterfront, basically above, just up the hill from where the Foss Waterway Seaport. That was another historic structure that we referenced that unfortunately is no longer here today, but was a prominent part of the Tacoma skyline. And I also tried to make sure that all of the tobacco referenced was something that was accurate to the time period that was out there. Uh, all of these were brands that you could have bought in downtown Tacoma, with the exception of to the best of my research and knowledge, Blue Boar Tobacco, which only made it as far as Spokane after being sold primarily in England. Uh, if you're curious about what the safe looks like underneath the Washington building today, here's a uh, more modern photo, not super, super modern, but still within the time period here. And one of the tunnels that was attempted uh, for a bank robbery in the area. And again, it's true. You can't dig too deep in Tacoma without hitting the water table. That's something that I also tried to make sure was pretty accurate to the area. Now, it's not just the, the Washington building that you can find downtown that sort of references a lot of what was going on. Um, the whole idea of doing a Maltese Falcon down here, complete sidebar, was exciting just because there are a nesting pair of peregrine falcons that have been coming here since 2017 on the uh, bank building just down the block a little from the Washington building. And uh, the top of the Washington building used to have a scientific zoo on the, the roof of it. So that whole part where Ray Rook goes and visits uh, forensic specialist Oscar Richter, there was an actual forensic specialist in Tacoma at, at the time that this was all taking place uh, whose name was Oscar Heinrich, I believe. And he brought a whole bunch of new scientific methods to the city of Tacoma. And one of the things that he was involved in was the scientific zoo on the top of the Washington building had a collection of giant Flemish rabbits where they would inoculate them with human blood and then use the rabbit blood uh, to do tests to determine on blood stains at crime scenes whether or not something was human or animal blood. Absolutely bizarre footnote that absolutely had to make it into the noir production because it's something that was going on in Tacoma that absolutely blew my mind. Whew. Also, if you don't know what a giant Flemish rabbit looks like, they are terrifying. <laughs> 
So the the Brotherhood Bank, uh, which is still the Washington Building, is downtown today. There are uh, a tremendous amount of detective photos that can be found in the Tacoma Public Library archives. And if you're walking around the UW campus, you might recognize this building. This is an ironic twist of fate. This is the Pinkerton Building, which was built in the late 1800s uh, as a hotel for Colonel Pinkerton, who had no affiliation with the Pinkerton Detective Agency. It operated as the Massasoit Hotel up until the early 1920s when it got shut down in a vice raid for selling illegal booze and not being able to pay anyone off. And then was a brief headquarters for the Pinkerton operative uh, and detective agency when they occupied it so that they could do investigation on security for the railroad. Uh, and it was just down the street from treasures like this one here. So at the end of the day, what I really wanted and I hope we accomplished with this was for people to have a deep appreciation for the tremendous amount of exquisite buildings, preserved history, cool stories, and sweet, sweet noir that have been going on in the city of Tacoma for a long time now. We're an underappreciated stop along I-5 and there's a lot going on here that I think people should really get to celebrate. But with that, my friends, I want to thank you all for coming on this journey start to finish. I really want to thank very sincerely the voice actors that made Tacoma Noir a reality and a huge, huge shout out, not just for this, but the City of Tacoma's Historic Preservation Office, in particular Lauren, for facilitating what I can only describe as the most extraordinary lineup of events for Historic Preservation Month that I've ever seen. And I'm someone who looks at a lot of history in the area, so you got to take my word for it. Uh, let me double check everything here. There's a very strong chance, my friends, much to my family's chagrin, that I will be producing yet another historically inspired Ray Rook murder mystery. I would like that to be something that we do uh, moving forward just to get people interested in the stuff that was going on out here and to remind people that just because someone's a shady woman doesn't mean she's guilty of a crime. Always look at the facts, not just what you feel. <laughs> uh, but seriously, Sally's a scumbag. Great voice, terrible person. With that, my friends, thank you so much for joining me on this journey. All of the Ray Rook Tacoma Noir series will live up on YouTube in exactly eight minutes, the conclusion will be published as its own thing on our YouTube channel, so you can always revisit it later. Thank you so much. Uh, all of this has been brought to you by the City of Tacoma's Historic Preservation Office, but if you always want to show additional appreciation, you can tip your guide on the homepage of prettygrittytours.com. And again, to my fantastic detectives out there, uh, Astrid Starcher and Michelle DeBell, for those of you who solved the mystery. Please send me your contact information. We're going to get you your copy of the Maltese Falcon. For all of you who got so close, I'm really proud of you. You did some amazing detective work. I'm just a shady dude who threw a lot of curveballs at you. Thank you all so much. Have a fantastic night. And as always, keep on exploring.